2 Chronicles chapter 17. And the title of our message is Picking Friends. Now, it's been said that you can pick your friends and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose. <laughs> it's true. Okay, that wasn't as funny as I hoped it would be. But um, our message today, of course, picking friends, and we're looking at a king by the name of Jeroboam. And he was a good king, one of eight good kings in the southern kingdom of Judah and the son of Asa. Now, last time we saw Asa, great king, great reforms, built the kingdom, fortified the cities, um, had a, a miraculous victory over um, a, you know, the troops from the south coming up, the Ethiopians trying to take them out, and was able to overcome that. But it, it was kind of at the end of his reign that he saw this opportunity to get one over on Basha, who was the second king in his, during his reign, um, to rule Israel. And um, Basha became a threat, starting to fortify cities close to the bo- south border, And so rather than consulting the Lord, rather than inquiring of the Lord, Asa took the treasuries from the the king's palace and the treasuries from the the Lord's house, and he sent them to Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, to um, circumvent and to um, attack at the north so that that Basha would leave and go north to try to deal with that. And um, that would give of course, Asa, the upper hand. He took the building materials that Basha was going to use to build a wall, and he built his own walls and fortified his own cities and and actually pushed forward into the the area of Ephraim and taking more cities from the northern kingdom of Israel. And so um, during that time, his kingdom grew, and 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 he had victory over Basha, but the problem was is, is he was rebuked because he didn't inquire of the Lord. And because he didn't inquire of the Lord, he ended up, um, getting rebuked by a prophet, and which ended up making him kind of freak out. He threw the prophet in jail. He oppressed some of the people. And, and the Bible tells us in the last chapter, in chapter 16, Second Chronicles 16, that he became diseased in his feet. And um, rather than seeking the Lord, it almost insinuates that if he would have sought the Lord, the Lord would have healed him. But he didn't seek the Lord, didn't inquire of the Lord about it. He went to the physicians instead, and it ended up being his death. But now his son, Jeroboam is going, or Jehoshaphat rather, is going to reign in his place. And so 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. So Jehoshaphat um, takes the throne. He sees um, threats to the north again. And so he's you know, he's kind of seen these different kings um, that have been there. He probably saw Basha, but he also saw Elam, and he sees Zimri, and then he sees Omri, and these kings up in the north. And so he's nervous about that. Omri was a great military leader, and he took a lot of land. And so he's kind of, you know, protecting himself against this northern threat that he sees there in Israel. Fortifies these cities um, in, in Judah, placing troops in Ephraim and all the borders of Israel. And Asa would be one of, again, eight good kings that would rule in the southern kingdom of Judah. No good kings in the northern kingdom of Israel. And um, so, you know, this this history is just trying to um, keep peace between these two borders, keep um, the fighting down, and especially as, as, as there's good kings in the south, that means that there's continually people who decide you know, we need to follow the Lord that are defecting into the, nor- the southern kingdom of Judah. And so that was something that was happening. And so it says, verse 3, Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked um, in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals. And so the Hebrew in this is kind of an interesting construct. And it's different translators look at it differently. And some of your translations may say, he walked in the ways his father walked in the early days and in the ways of David. Um, it's, it's difficult to decipher. 
It could be translated either way. But basically probably saying he walked in the ways of Asa like he walked when he was at the beginning of his reign. Not at the end of his reign where he stopped inquiring of the Lord, but at the beginning of his reign and also in the ways that David walked. Of course, that was the, those were the you know, good kings of Israel, the kings that served the Lord, that followed the Lord, that um, were blessed by the Lord. And so, um, you know, there's no greater alliance you can have than to have the Lord on your side. And so he doesn't seek the Baals. Now, the word Baal, you know, is the name of a god, but it also just means Lord. And so he didn't serve the other gods. In other words, he didn't serve the demons. And this is a practice, you know, I mean, we don't, we don't think of it too much in our culture, and it's probably more prevalent than we want to, to, know, to believe. You know, but people worship all kinds of things. And, and people worship things to try to gain power, to try to gain, you know, status. And, and it's amazing, you know, if you, if you look into some of that stuff, it, it just spook you out. You know, I mean, people are doing astrology and they're sacrificing to things and all kinds of things that people do, you know, that we just don't like to think about. Now, it's not for us to be concerned about that in the sense that, you know, those people need Jesus just like everybody else. And so just because they say they worship the devil or they worship, you know, something else doesn't mean that we shouldn't share the gospel with them. But, but the reality is, is this world is filled with people who worship things other than the Lord. In fact, that's probably most people. In our culture, you know, we could say that people, they worship Bacchus, which is drunkenness, you know, getting high. Um, people in our culture, they worship materialism. You know, um, at convenience, Molech, you know, abortion. You know, we saw the abortion bill pass in, in, in New York um, State yesterday. I mean, just ridiculous how horrible that is. They can abort a baby right before it's born. You know, right before it's, the woman gives birth, they can abort it up to the end. Um, just horrible things that are happening. And, you know, it's just, it's just modern Molech worship. You know, that's what people are doing. And, and in other cultures, they're more honest about it, I suppose, because they actually worship the demons themselves, you know, and, and especially in, in you know, places where indigenous, peoples live, indigenous people live, you know, out in the bush, out in the you know, jungle or whatever, people worship demons. And it's, there's no, no joke to that. There's no, um, no uh, hiding it. They just straight up worship demons. And, and so... Um, here, you know, he's, he's not worshiping the demons. He's not going after the things that are promising. If you, if you sacrifice to this or you sacrifice to that, you're going to, um, you know, gain somehow. It, but instead, verse 4, it says, But he sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. So the most important thing about a person in the world is what they believe and what they think about who God is. And there is no greater alliance you can have in your life than being on the Lord's side. Remember what God's word to Asa was? He had that great victory over the Ethiopians. And, and God, by the prophet, said to him, If you seek me, I will be found by you, but if you forsake me, I will forsake you. That's, that was God's word to Asa. And Asa rejoiced in that because that was the time in his life when he was seeking him. Well, here Jehoshaphat finds himself deciding to follow the Lord. And he grew up, his father, his father never forsook the Lord. He never, you know, completely ignored the Lord. He just kind of, you know, distracted himself at the end of his life. He never worshipped other gods. Um, but, but we have to make a decision in our life. Because in our context, we are facing th- you know, things all the time. We are facing choices. Am I going to follow the Lord or am I going to follow the world? And he grew up in the same world that we grew up in. He grew up in the same world with the same flesh, with the same desires that we have. Hey, would somebody get the, turn the heat down? It is like steaming hot up here, like I'm going to fall, pass out or something. Turn it down to like 69 so it doesn't kick on. Anyway, sorry. Before I die. Are you guys hot? It's just super hot up here. Okay, the women are like, no, I'm freezing cold. <sighs> anyway, so we, we have to make that decision to, to forsake the Lord 
or to forsake the world. You know, that's what we have to do. And everybody makes that decision in their life. Am I going to follow the Lord and forsake the world? Or am I going to follow the world and forsake the Lord? You know, and, and the reality is, is that when we come to the Lord, it's at that point in our life that we belong to Him. We belong to His kingdom. We belong to a different set of ideologies, a different a set of rules, a different set of lifestyles. And, and if we follow the world, then we're, we're pushing against those things. We're, we're going in the wrong direction. And, and the most miserable person, of course, the, the most miserable person in the world, the most miserable nation in the world, and I think we might be there as a nation, is that nation that struggles between two opinions. That's the, you know, when we, we try to live life, you know, half in the world and half out of the world. You know, I'm, I'm living like everyone else. And yet I want to seek the Lord. That's the most miserable person in the world. I mean, you might as well be completely in the world or completely with the Lord, right? Uh, e- even in the, in the church, you know, the Lord does not, you know, we see that in the book of Revelation when Jesus talks to the church of Laodicea. He says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. You know, I don't want you to be lukewarm. A lot of people misunderstand what he's saying by that. He says, I'd rather you be hot like a refreshing cup of coffee that gives life. Or I'd rather you be cold, like a refreshing, cool drink. But you ever drink something that's like right in the middle and it's no good for anybody? You drink it and you're like, ugh, it's too warm. If it was cold, it'd be great. If it was hot, it'd be great. But I don't want it lukewarm. And and he, he doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to be either refreshing or he wants us to be on fire, right? You gotta be one or the other. But you can't be puny, lukewarm. And that's, that's where Asa kind of ended his life. Um, but, but here, um, Jehoshaphat is actually deciding, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what the Lord wants me to do. And it says, because of that, notice this, verse 5, therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah gave presents to Jeho- Jehoshaphat, and he had riches and honor in abundance. So Jehoshaphat strengthens his kingdom, but notice that the Lord here in verse 5 established his kingdom. You know, he was strengthening his kingdom. He was trying to send out troops and fortify his his walls against the the northern kingdom. He he saw that as a threat, but at the same time he was seeking the Lord. And as he, 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 he strengthened his kingdom, and you'll notice that, Abijah strengthened his kingdom, Rehoboam had strengthened his kingdom, but here, the Lord established His kingdom. And you know, we can be as strong as we, you know, we can think we have it all together. You know, we can have all, all the money we want to have in the bank account. We can have all the prospects for the future. We can have all of the health that we think we want. And we can try to just, you know, do life on our own. But unless the Lord establishes us, we really are standing on shaky ground. You know, we're like the man who builds his house upon the sand. You know, rather than he who builds his house upon the rock. And so here we see Jehoshaphat really building his house upon the rock. So what does he do with that stability? Verse 6, it says, And his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places and the wooden images from Judah. What happens when we make our Lord our delight? Well, in his presence is fullness of joy, right? At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. He saw the Lord blessing him. He saw the Lord strengthening him. So he made the Lord his delight. You know, it's interesting how we can kind of vacillate. You know, and, and the reality is that sometimes when things are hard, we're close to the Lord. And then when things get easy, we walk away from the Lord. Or maybe we're not as in tune to the Lord. Jehoshaphat didn't let that happen to him. He saw things were getting easy, things were getting good, things were getting, he's being blessed, he's being given gifts, he's multiplying in wealth. And so what does he do? He delights himself in the Lord even more. And what does the Bible say about he who delights himself in the Lord? God will give him the desires of his heart. And that, that's what he's doing here. So his father had already done this, removed these high places. But 
it probably needed to be do it, done again. You know, remember when his father's walk wasn't so good. His, he was diseased in his feet. But he wasn't walking straight with the Lord. And so it, I think that's what happens when, when things start to, you know, are getting good maybe in our lives and we think we're strong. And just like Asa, he, you know, spent this money to hire another guy to, to take care of his problems for him. And he thought things were going great. His walk kind of got off. And then he finds himself diseased in his feet. And while he's down, diseased in his feet, people start building idols in the high places again. And, and isn't that the way that it is? When we're not following the Lord, our walk's not so good, that's when the strongholds start to get built up in our lives, isn't it? That's when we, we don't pay attention to those things and they start to, to take hold and so it's to get our walk back again and to start taking those high places down again or to start dealing with those problems, those things that, that took root when, when we were weak in our faith. And so verse 7, it says, Also in the third year of his reign, he sent leaders, ben Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah, and with them he sent Levites, Shemiah, um, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Asahel, um, Shemaramoth, <laughs> Jehoah Nathan, um, Adonijah, and to- Tobijah, and Tobadonaijah, <laughs> and the Levites, <laughs> and with them Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. So he, he fortifies his cities, he takes down these high places, and, and this is something that is, is pretty remarkable. He sees that maybe Judah, you know, the people are not really following the Lord, and so what does he do? He sends these guys who are teachers out into the entire land, guys who can teach the word of the people, who can spread the word of the Lord, and to encourage the people to follow the Lord. And notice what it says, verse 9, So they taught in Judah, and they had the book of the law of the Lord with, with them, and they went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. And there is nothing more important than the teaching of God's word to the people of God, that they would establish themselves, that they would grow, that they would mature in their walk with the Lord, and that they would become effective in their lives. You know, it is amazing what happens when there is a famine of the Word of God within the lives of the people and the hearts of the people. And we see that. I mean, just look at our nation. This used to be a nation that was a Bible-believing, a Bible-carrying nation. But the church has slowly and slowly got weaker, moved away from the teaching of the Word of God, Um, You know, basically teaching things that people want to hear. Some churches not even teaching the Bible at all. You know, I heard of this one one relative of mine going to a church where the the pastor, um, she was teaching Harry Potter. (laughs) Something about, you know, the virtues of Harry Potter and, and, and how it compares to the gospel or something like that. I mean, seriously, is there not anything good within the Bible to teach that you have to try to teach Harry Potter or something else like that or Star Wars in the gospel or something? I mean, it's like ridiculous. You know, the Bible is what we need. And, and yet people don't think that people are interested in the Bible. And yet it's so rich and it's so full of, of stories and, and lessons. I mean, just amazed as we go through and we look at these kings of Israel and the, and the victories that they have and the defeats that they have and the stupid things that they do and how it just it applies so much to my own life. I'm like, I'm just as boneheaded as these guys. And I can see the way that the Lord worked in their lives and how he pulled them from those places and he established them or he... He rebuked them and, and even cursed them because of their stupid decisions. And, and that helps us. You know, these things are written, the New Testament will tell us, as examples to us that we who have inherited the end of the age might fear, might realize, hey, you know what? This is how God works amongst his people. And this is what God desires from us. He desires truth in the inward parts. He desires us to follow him with all of our heart. He desires to bless us. 
And, and, and we open that opportunity for blessing if we turn from our wicked ways and seek his face. And these are the lessons we're learning as we look at these kings. And so Jehoshaphat, just an awesome king, he's like, man, people need to know the word of the Lord. You know, it's not about exalting myself as a king. It's not about being the best king and being the most honored and being the richest. He spends the money and sends out these teachers to go throughout the whole land with the book of the law to teach the people how to follow the Lord. And when we teach the people how to follow the Lord and we go through the book of the Word, the word of God together, it, it blesses us. It helps us to see which way to walk. And it, it convicts us and it challenges us. You know, heaven forbid we just go through life just thinking, oh, I'm just going to do my own thing and I'm just going to follow my own way and I'm just going to try to be the best that I can. I mean, we've all tried that, I think. And realize that that leads us in a mess. And so we cling to the word of God and we take these lessons and we allow them to be applied to our life. And that's what he was doing. He was sending these guys out. And, and notice what happens as a result of that. Verse 10, it says, And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms and lands that were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. See, there's a spiritual battle that's raging. And when we're weak spiritually, it opens us up to attack from the enemy, and that oftentimes comes from other people. But when we're strengthened spiritually, just like the nation of Israel was strengthened spiritually, it, it, it held off the evil forces that were working in the countries around them, and, and God gave them victory, gave them peace, even blessing, and the fear of the Lord would fall on the kingdoms and the lands around Judah. So they were afraid to make war. And it's the same way in our lives. When we're close to the Lord, it, it strengthens us against the attack of the enemy. Now, unfortunately, oftentimes when we want to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, then the, the attack of the enemy comes, doesn't it? But we, you know, if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us, the Bible tells us. And so, Joseph is just really doing the right thing. You know, he, he's not only strengthening himself in the Lord, but he's strengthening the whole nation. You know, and we can think of that in our own context, can't we? You know, I don't want to just strengthen myself in the Lord, but I want to be an influence on maybe my kids or the people that I work with or the people that live around me or the people I have influence over. That I would be an example, that I would be able to, you know, bring the word to other people besides just myself. And this is what really makes Jehoshaphat stand out. Verse 11, it says, Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and silver as tribute. And the Arabian, um, uh, Arabians, sorry, Arabians brought in him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 male goats. So Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful and he built fortresses and storage cities in Judah and had much property in the cities of Judah. And the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in Jerusalem. Did you, did you see that? The Philistines <laughs> brought him presents. You know, and that's pretty amazing. You think about the Philistines and what a plague they had been to David and to, to Saul and the, the former kings, and now they're bringing presents to him. Proverbs sixteen seven says this, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so the Lord's prospering him in his obedience. You know, and the Lord does that for us as well. He prospers us in our obedience. And that doesn't necessarily mean monetary prosperity. Sometimes the Lord will bless us that way, but it brings just peace to our soul, doesn't it? And we have a peace in our soul that the Lord gives us. He prospers us. So he is strengthened his bottom line, his financial situation, he's strengthened in his country, his, his, his walls are fortified, and he's strengthened in his military. Notice this, verse 14. These are, the, these are their numbers according to their father's houses of Judah, the captains of thousands, Ad, um, Adana, the captain, and with him 300,000 mighty men of valor. Next to him was Jehoahan, the captain, and with him 280,000. Next to him was Amasha, the son of Zikri, um, Zikri, whatever, who willingly offered himself to the Lord, and with him 200,000 mighty men of valor. Of Benjamin, Eliada, the mighty man of valor, 
and with him 200,000 200, men of, armed with a bow and shield. And next to him, Jehozabad, that's an awesome name, Jehozabad, and with him 180,000 prepared for war. These served the king besides those um, the king put in fortified cities throughout all of Judah. So the, these guys, who this is just his standing army. This isn't the soldiers that are standing at the border, and this is 1,600,000 men. 1,600,000 men. Now remember um, back to Abijah, he had 400,000 when he went up against Jeroboam, who had 800,000 at the time. And then Asa, his son, had 580,000 who went up against a million um, with the Ethiopians. But now he has... 1,160,000 man army. And, and his kingdom is growing, not only in strength, in wealth, in fortification, in a military. And yet, where's the strength of his nation? It's the Lord. It's always the Lord. See, that's something that he, every one of us has to understand. It doesn't matter how big or how powerful or how much influence we have. If we don't have the Lord, we don't have anything. And so this is blessing. This is blessing. And this is what Proverbs 14.34 tells us. It says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance. And verse, verse 1 is where I'm at. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance. And by marriage, he allied himself with Ahab, the Arab. Not so good. One of the most important things that we do in life is pick people who we're going to hang out with. To pick people that are going to be our friends. Pick people that we're going to spend our off time with. And, and play with and have fun with and whatever. We're going to hang out with these people. And that can be a blessing in our life, or it can be a curse in our life. And I'm sure to some degree, depending on the friends you've picked for yourself at times in your life, you have experienced both blessing and curse based on the choices you make on who are going to be your friends, who are you going to hang out with, who are you going to go you know, um, play golf with or hang out with after work or whatever. Experts say that you can tell what type of person you are by looking at the five people that you hang out with the most. The five people you spend the most time with will show you what type of person you are. Are you a healthy person? That probably means the five closest people to you are healthy people. Are you a wealthy person? That probably means the five closest people close to you are successful and wealthy. Are you a lazy person? I don't know, <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter. It, are you a godly person? If you're a godly person, then look at the five people who are closest to you. They're probably godly people. And that's just what sociologists have figured out. You know, five people that you hang out with the most are a good cross section of who you are as a person. And, and I suppose that, you know, the Apostle Paul would, would understand these things to a degree when he tells the Corinthians a couple things. In 1 Corinthians 15.33, he says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. You, you think you're, you know, you're a you know, solid person and you have good disciplined habits and you start hanging out with somebody who's not a solid person and doesn't have good disciplined habits and you find out pretty quickly that they can drag you down. You know, sometimes it's easier to, you know, have you ever noticed that if you're standing on a chair, it's easier for somebody to pull you off that chair than it is for you to pull somebody up onto the chair? You know, you hang out with people that drag you down, you know, then you find yourself getting drugged down a lot easier than you can pull other people up. And so to surround yourself with the right types of people is kind of a good idea. The other thing is 2 Corinthians 6.14 Paul warns the Corinthians, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness. Jehoshaphat is going to find himself doing both, not only getting drugged down because he allied himself with Ahab. You know, and I get it. You know, he's scared of the border. He's scared of that northern border. Those people are scary up there, those, those Israelites. 
They're going to come down and they're going to take out the, the Jews, you know. They're going to come down and, and destroy Judah. And so he's nervous about that. And so he sees an opportunity. He sees the daughter of Ahab and she's, you know, that looks like a good match for my boy. And so he arranges the marriage and gets Ahab's daughter. Um, and you have to remember Ahab's daughter is also who else's daughter? Jezebel's daughter. And she's cut from the same cloth as her mama. She's a mess. And so he says, well, here's an opportunity to join these families together so that we can, we can be one again. We can you know, be cohesive. So I don't have to fear my northern border. And so he marries off his daughter to, or his son rather, to Ahab's daughter. And it says, verse 2, after some years he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria and killed, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. Okay, now this is interesting. Here he finds himself going up to visit his in-law, I guess you could call him whatever, outlaw. And he comes down to Samaria and Ahab has his palace and um, getting together, has his royal retreat, he treats him like a king, you know, sacrifices all these animals, makes his big feast, have a big barbecue over at Ahab's place. Now you have to remember that the northern kingdom didn't have any good kings. Not one in their entire history. Not one good king. And Ahab was the very worst king of all the kings that the northern kingdom had. They were all bad. Ahab was the worst. They found excavations of Ahab's palace. And they, what they found was all these jars all the way around, buried next to his palace. And in all these jars were babies that had been sacrificed to Molech. Ahab was a disgusting person. He he worshipped devils. He worshipped success. He worshipped everything that you're not supposed to worship. The Baals and the Ashtoreth. And and that was all brought down from his, um, I think she was Syrophoenician or whatever she was, but his wife Jezebel who led him into all this idolatry. And she was a very, very, very wicked, wicked person. And Ahab was right there with her. And so now he's joined himself to this. And notice how easily he's persuaded to join him to go against the Syrians. He goes up and he persuaded him. Hey, join me. Let's go up against um, kirjath and Let's do it. Let's go get him. Or Ramoth Gilead, rather. Let's go get these guys. The Syrians. Verse 3, it says, So Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go up with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, and my people as your people. We will be with you in war. Hmm. Hey, why not? We're family, right? Let's just do it. Then, verse 4, And also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Well, better late than never. Yeah, I'll go with you, but let's, let's talk to the Lord about it. Let's ask if the Lord wants us to do. After he already said yes. That's kind of the backwards, right? Well, at least he did it. But let's inquire of the Lord. I'm in, but let's inquire of the Lord. Verse 5, it says, Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall, we ref- shall I refrain? So they said, Go up for God will deliver it into the king's hand. So these are the, these are the prophets prophesying victory over Ramoth Gilead, 400 of them, 400 prophets. But Jehoshaphat, as he sees these prophets and he sees maybe the things that they do to prophesy, maybe the tools that they use in their prophecy, prophesying, he begins to get suspicious. And he notices out of all 400 that these aren't prophets of the Lord. These aren't, you know, Jewish prophets. These are pagan prophets prophesying 
that God will deliver the king into their hands. And it says, but verse 6, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? <laughs> so he's noticing that all these prophets, and that's the thing you have to realize is every culture pretty much has people who have maybe a gift of prophecy. You know, there was Balaam for Balak. And he inquired of the Lord. There's the Oracle of Delphi for the Greeks during the time um, of uh, Paul and, and those guys. There was people would inquire of this Oracle. And there was um, Epimenides and different throughout the history. There's been different prophets in different cultures that would prophesy and they would speak sometimes for the Lord and sometimes they would speak for demons. They just were these people who were open to those types of things. And sometimes the Lord would fill their mouth with the prophecy. But they weren't prophets of the Lord. They were just people who prophesied. They were clairvoyants or whatever, shaman of, of some kind. But here, specifically, Joseph out realizes this is not right. These people are not prophets of the Lord. And so are they truly prophesying the truth? Or are they prophesying a lie? And so he says, isn't there a prophet of Yahweh here? Isn't there a Jewish prophet? You know? Verse 7, So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. You know, don't be, don't be like that, you know. He, he's, he's good, probably, you know. Don't worry about it. it it's just, it, I don't know. I don't see why this... Ahab doesn't see the irony of that. You know, here's the one prophet of the Lord, God of Israel, and he says bad things about me. Hmm. <laughs> Might want to think about that. You know, I mean, is it me or is it him? And I don't know why Joseph doesn't see that either. This should be a problem here. He says, oh, don't talk like that. Verse 8. Then the king of Israel called one of his officers and said, bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. And the king of Israel and, and Joseph, the king of Judah, clothed in their royal robes, sat each on his throne and sat at the threshing floor at the entrance to the gate of Samaria and all the prophets prophesied before them. This had to be a spectacle. You know, they're sitting there in their thrones. They have their... Um, they're there in the city gates, which is where they would make decisions and where, you know, everything would kind of go down, big courtyard there. And, and, it, and it says, now Zedekiah, the son of Jehananen, had made horns of iron for himself and said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. I suppose that one, one horn for each of the kings, you know, he's out there, you know, doing this display and a dance or something. And all the, prophet, pro, all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver, um, deliver it into the king's hand. So props and everything. These guys are prophesying and they're you know, doing whatever they're doing to try to encourage the king to go into this battle. Joseph, Jehoshaphat isn't so sure. He's, he's a little bit leery of this whole display. You know, this isn't the way we do it down in Judah. This isn't the way it happens in Jerusalem. You know, we bring out the prophet and he is humble and he goes before the Lord and he comes out with what the Lord has to say and that settles it. Here we have this crazy, 400 guys displayed. Verse 12, Then the messenger who had gone to call him Micaiah spoke to him saying, Now listen, the words of the the prophets with one accord encouraged the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. I'm guessing that this messenger has probably dealt with Micaiah before. He's like, hey, we know what you're all about. You're always the naysayer. You come in amongst the other guys and you shoot everybody down. No, you need to say the same things that everybody else is saying. And Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that... I will speak. And this is the difficult thing about being a prophet or even being about somebody who loves the Lord. The Lord doesn't always give us easy messages to deliver, does He? I remember one time I had a friend. 
He was into some things he probably shouldn't have been into. I didn't even really know what was going on. But I felt like the Lord very strongly told me, go and talk to him. Now, here's the thing. I didn't think that he would take it well. (laughs) You know, have you ever been there where you you feel like you need to go talk to somebody, but you don't think they're going to take it well? I don't think that the Lord's probably sending you if you're excited to go. I'm excited to put him in his place. I'm going to go tell him, you know, what's up. But, you know, I just, I had this fear in my heart, like, man, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried for my friend and I don't want to ruin our friendship. And I remember going to him and he didn't take it well. I mean, he didn't take, it, didn't take it as bad as he could have taken it, but he didn't take it great. But I went and delivered the message. And then what, what's beautiful about that, even though he kind of just pushed me off and told me I didn't know what I was talking about, later on he came to me and said, you know what, this is what was going on. I had no idea. It was worse than I thought, but I nailed it, you know, with what I told him. And he repented. You know, the message isn't always easy to deliver. It's not always, you know, sunshine and roses. Sometimes it's doom and gloom. And yet we have to be faithful to what the Lord tells us to speak. And so this guy, he's like, I'm not going to say anything but what the Lord tells me to say. If the Lord tells me to say it, that's what I'm going to say. I remember um, reading the book, If I Perish, by Ann Sook, Ann Isook. Um, she was a Korean teacher who found herself in trouble with the Japanese when they came in in World War II. They invaded Korea, and they were trying to get everybody to bow down to the flag, the sun on the flag. And and she wouldn't bow down, you know, Christian and everything. And so she ended up running from the authorities. Long story, but anyway, she ends up, just by God's supernatural hand, because it's, it was a miracle how she got there, but she ended up in Japan. Now, she had been in Japan as a, as a child or as a young girl because she went to school. She went to a Christian seminary, actually, in Japan. And so she had friends in Japan, but they were invading Korea, and here she is, a Korean in Japan. And her and this other man by the name of Elder Park felt like the Lord told them, we want you, I want you to write out this judgment against Japan for the sins of what they've done against my people in Korea. Because Korea was uh, largely because of missionary um, work that had been done there and uh, just huge, massive amounts of Christians in Korea. And so mostly a Christian nation. And, and so she, went, she was in Japan. They wrote out this big, long judgment on this large scroll and they went to the diet, where it's the diet of Japan is basically their their Supreme Court, if you will, or their House of Representatives or their Senate or something like that along those lines where they're making decisions about war and how they're going to attack, you know, America and Pearl Harbor and all that. They're making these plans. And they stood up in the middle of it, and they were up in the balcony, and nobody's supposed to do that. They stood up in the middle of it, and they yelled out, you know, thus says the Lord, you're going to be judged for, you know, the things you've done to the Christians in Korea. And they dropped this scroll over the thing. And basically in the scroll, they wrote, if you do not repent, God is going to rain down fire and brimstone on all of these cities. And they named all the cities. And after, you know, she was arrested, of course, and she was put in jail. They took her back to Korea, put her in in a woman's prison for, for a couple of years anyway. And when she finally got out and the war was over, it was right after two of the cities that, we, that she listed, um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, had been bombed. And then she had an opportunity to tour through the country and see all the cities, one by one, listed in her judgment that had been napalmed at or nuked, you know, in, in, just in order. It's pretty amazing. But God doesn't mess around. When he brings... Um, when he brings his prophecy against a nation or against a person, it's to be heeded. And this is the thing about that. I don't think that God does that without convicting the hearts of all the people who are under that judgment that it's from the Lord. And I believe that we have a moment there, a moment of clarity there, when God truly is speaking something to us through another person where the Lord is saying, yes. This is me. Now, I know that there's all kinds of people. You know, we see this is getting really popular in churches today where people prophesy all kinds of false stuff. And they're encouraged to. Oh, just do it. You know, just do it because you don't know. Maybe it's the Lord, maybe it's not. And so they're prophesying all kinds of garbage over people. And sometimes it hits and sometimes it doesn't. Don't listen to anybody. 
if, they, if that's the practice that they're practicing. This is very popular in the church today. It is poisonous and it's demonic at best. But when somebody's prophesying in the name of the Lord and they speak to you and they say, the Lord told me to tell you this and it hits you and you know it. Because I guarantee you, if it's the Lord, he, doesn't, he has your address just as much as he has their address. And I guarantee you that nine times out of ten, if not more, the Lord's already been speaking that to you. And so when they come to you and say that, it hits target, doesn't it? And you're like, okay. You know, I, I know, that's what the Lord's saying to me. And, and yet, if, if somebody's just you know, speaking something and it's not hitting, it's, there's nothing there, you know, you know, don't disc- don't discount it because it may become clear later. But you know, most of the time, if the Lord hasn't spoken it to you, then he, it's not Him speaking. People are prophesying falsely. Here we have four hundred false prophets prophesying, and they're prophesying what they want to hear, right? But Jehoshaphat doesn't feel right about it. You know, he didn't have a piece about that prophecy. It didn't feel right. It doesn't mean that it wasn't right. Because sometimes the Lord confirms things. I'll give you an example. When, when um, Shannon was having my son Isaiah, and we were in the room, you know, he's about ready to be, you know, he's supposed to be born. She's been in labor for a long, long time. And one of the brothers from our church came and he told me, you know, I, I, I just came here from my house. I felt like the Lord told me Shannon's going to have to have a C-section and I'm supposed to come and tell you that. And I was like, okay. So I, I filtered it. And I think we should always filter everything through the Word of God. And, and first thing I thought was, prophecy brings edification, exhorta- exhortation, or comfort to men. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, right? Prophecy is for ex- exhortation, edification, or comfort to men. This isn't exhortive. It's not edifying, and it's not comforting. And so I just put it in my pocket and held on to that information. You know, I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm not receiving that, at least not yet. And so we went into um, the, and that's for the church, of course. But we, we went into the, um, I went back into the delivery room and I was talking to Shannon. She's like, what did he want? And I said, oh, he just was asking how you were because he did. And she's like, okay. She's like, why would he bother us? And I was like, oh, it doesn't matter. Well, about an hour later, the doctor came in and he said, okay, I have some, some suggestions. He says, there's these five things that are wrong. And he listed all five of them. And he said, um, you know, so what I recommend is a C-section. And so I asked the questions I was trying to ask. So what if we don't do anything? You know, what if we wait? What if we, you know, and just went through the list of things, asked the doctor the questions and he answered them. He says, I have a surgical team ready. Shannon burst into tears, just absolutely burst into tears. Now I knew <laughs> that this was from the Lord and it was the time to deliver the message. And so she's sitting there crying. I asked her mom and her, the doctor and everybody to leave. And I said, hey, honey, when Tom called me out there to talk to me, he told me that the Lord had told him that you were going to have to have a C-section and his wife confirmed it as he was getting his coat. And she's like, really? And I said, yeah. And she just like went from bawling to just like excited and happy. And she's like, well, then let's have this baby. And I was like, okay. And so I went and got the doctor and the doctor came in and she's smiling and giddy. Like she was bawling and devastated a minute ago. And he's like, what did you say to her? You know, so sometimes, you know, on rare occasions, you know, the, the message is delivered early. But a lot of times the Lord's going to speak to, and I'd say nine times out of ten or more, the Lord's going to speak to both sides, right? So nobody's going to be delivering messages about, oh, you're supposed to marry this person, or you're supposed to do this, or God told me that you're never supposed to be married, or God said you're, or whatever people say to people ignorantly and abusively, and the Lord didn't say anything to you about it. And now you're carrying some burden that isn't from the Lord at all. Does that make sense? And so the Lord, He works um, in these ways. And so, he says, I'm going to say whatever the Lord tells me to say. Verse 14, he says, Then, it came, then he came to the king, and the king said, um, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And he said, Go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. 
And, and, and we know that that's the way he said it because obvious sarcasm. And Ahab knows it. In verse 15 it says, So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you will tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So the, the, the king hears this mockery, this, this sarcasm or this insincerity at best in his voice and says, you know, are you lying to me? You know, are you, are you just trying to deceive me? And then comes the real message. That was part of what the Lord wanted him to say. But this is what he says next. Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Now, how, could, how, would, how is Jehoshaphat feeling at this moment? Like, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong company, you know? What is going on? You know, here's this prophet, the one prophet of the Lord, the one guy I feel like I can trust, and he's saying, you know, this isn't going to go well. And then, it gets better, Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing on his right hand and his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade King Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. So he's, it's God. He's sitting there. He's talking to the angels. And they're you know, giving their opinions. Well, I could go and do this or I could go and do that. Then, verse 20, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Ahab was a very, very wicked person. And you remember, if you remember First Kings, that in, a, in Israel, Ahab ruled, and he ruled for a long, long time. He was definitely judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel. And not only did he worship Baal and Ashereth, but you remember the story of Nabal's vineyard. This man who loved the Lord, had a vineyard close to Ahab's palace, and Ahab wanted his vineyard. And so he tried to buy it from Nabal. But, or um, is it Nabal? I don't know. Is his name? Yeah, I guess that was his name. I don't know. But anyway, he wanted to buy the vineyard. But Ahab, he wouldn't sell it to Ahab. And so Ahab cried to Jezebel. Jezebel said, give me your pants. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of it. <laughs> she went and she had men speak falsely, false witnesses against him. Naboth, not Nabal. Naboth. Nabal was the bad guy that David killed, or almost killed. Um, Naboth. And, and she had these guys speak evil against Naboth. And so they said, he, he blasphemed the Lord, and so they stoned him. And Ahab went down and took his vineyard. And so this is just a wicked guy, you know, just treachery and evil, worshiping Baal, worshiping Ashtoreth. Um, all these things that he's doing. And so God sits in heaven and he's talking to the angels about this. And, and something we have to understand, just like in, in the book of Job, Satan is there. And we don't know if this is Satan or if this is just a demon, but it is a lying spirit. It's a, a demonic spirit that's in the presence of the Lord. And that's something maybe we don't think about. You know, I think we have this idea of Dante's Inferno, Inferno or... Or ideas from Milton, you know, we read those, those books that, that, you know, there's hell down here, you know, there's the underworld where Satan lives and he's down there with all the demons and then God's up here in heaven and there's these equally opposing kingdoms of light and dark and everything else. No, it's not even true. Hell, Satan is not in hell. He's in heaven and all of his demons are in heaven. They will be cast out. You know, the Lord will cast them out of heaven at one point during the middle of the tribulation period, the last seven years. But for now, they're still amongst the angels. Just like in Job, when all the angels, all the sons of God, presented themselves before the Lord, the angels, and they 
Um, and Satan was with them. And he asked Satan, where have you been? What you been up to? He said, I've been wandering to and fro amongst the earth. And that's the same thing that's happening here. You know, the devil still has access to God. He accuses the church. He accuses you before God day and night. He's the accuser of the brethren, right? And so here's this demon who's there, and God's like, you know, I want to bring, I'm going to bring judgment against Ahab. And he says, I'll volunteer. I'll go and I'll prophesy lies in the name of the Lord. And so this demon is given permission. You know, that's the thing we have to understand is nothing happens without God's permission. And yet, you know, Satan is the ruler of this world in a sense. Um, and God um, gives, grants him permission sometimes to afflict even sometimes people who belong to the Lord. But nothing happens without God's permission. And so here this guy comes down and he, his demon comes down and he fills the mouths of all the prophets with a demonic message. And so verse 22, it says, Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chenina, whatever his name is, and went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? These guys obviously were not prophets of the Lord, but they were prophesying in the name of the Lord. So, and we've talked about this a little bit, but how do we know? <laughs> you know, how do we know as a Christian that this word that I'm getting from the Lord is from the Lord? Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 tells us that prophecy it speaks exhortation, edification, or comfort to men. So it's probably within the first three verses. I think I said verse one, but it's probably. Let's no, actually just turn there. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says, okay, oh yeah, um, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him, however in the spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. And, and so this is, the, this is what prophecy does. If it does something other than that to the Christian, if it doesn't, you know, and it can exhort you, you know, do the right thing. You know, the Lord wants you to turn from this. But it's, it's also going to, or it's going to be an edification, you know, build you up, prophesying good things about you, or um, comfort to you, you know, in difficult time. That's what the Lord's going to use prophecy for. If it doesn't accomplish one of those three things, then you have to wonder, is this really from the Lord? John, um, in 1 John 4, 4, 1, tells us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. This is so important, especially in this day and age, because you guys don't know, there is a revival amongst all kinds of weird things happening within the church, and it's not... I don't believe good in a lot of ways. You know, it's, 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 and it's difficult. You know, deception in the church is a difficult thing. I want you to realize this. Deception within the church isn't just pure evil. Deception with the, within the church is the tares amongst the wheat. It doesn't just come as like, okay, here's a church over here, and oh my goodness, that guy, that big church in, in Texas, that big church in California, those people are all evil. Not necessarily. In fact, there might be even some fruit amongst that. And God has a lot of believers in that. But, but here comes this overarching message behind that whole thing, and it's the tares that are kind of running everything. It's kind of a scary thought. You know, within a church body, I mean, you could imagine Jesus said that there's all kinds of, you know, the seed is, is, is uh, thrown in all kinds of different soils, right? And some of it's legitimate. It's going to reach in the ground and it's going to produce tenfold. But others amongst the stones, amongst 
the, the thorns. Some of it's on the path. It doesn't have any root at all. And then amongst all of that, there's tares. There's false brethren that are mixed in within the church at large. And some of those, some of those tares are people who are leading churches or leading small groups. And they're wolves amongst the sheep. And Jesus said, don't try to pluck them out. You know, it's funny, I, I watch guys sometimes, and they're, they're all about, you know, I, somebody sent me a thing the other day, Calvary Chapel, apostasy, you know, Calvary Chapel, you know. And it, I watched the thing, it was an hour and a half long, an oh, hour and a half, I'll never get back. And it was just talking about how, you know, this guy did a conference with that guy, and that guy's that heretic, and so therefore that guy's a heretic too. Well, obviously, Josephat's not a heretic, and yet here he is with Ahab. Sometimes we make dumb decisions about the people we hang out with. It doesn't mean you're a heretic. Just because somebody um, did a conference with somebody else, you know, doesn't mean that they're all bad, you know. Uh, It would have been different if I would have heard clips of these guys, you know, all these Calvary pastors teaching heresy, but they weren't. They just went to a conference they probably shouldn't have gone to. You know, and I think we probably all agree with that. You know, that's why is he doing at that conference? But then you listen to him talk about it. You know, it's like Greg Laurie on TBN. That was one of them. You know, and that's no secret. And Greg Laurie says, you know what? I get a huge audience and they let me come and preach the gospel. He says, you know, I'm all about the gospel. And if they're going to let me come on and preach the gospel, I'm going to use that opportunity to do that. But guilty by association. So he's obviously a heretic. You know, but he, you know, if you'd listen to his teaching, you only hear the solid truth of the Bible, you know, so that's the difficulty of this whole thing. But there's always going to be the false amongst the real. And so John tells his beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. What do you think the book of Galatians is about? What do you think the book of um, 1 Corinthians is about, and 2 Corinthians is about. False prophets, people who are not living the Christian life, living amongst other Christians, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. And so we always have to use discernment and say, Lord, help me through this. We always have to, and this is where it gets really easy, inquire of the Lord. Lord, is that from you? Lord, do you want me to go through with this? Lord, do you want me to, to believe what this person's telling me? And, and just inquire of the Lord. It's, it's that simple. You have a relationship with the Lord. Test the spirits. Lord, is this from you? Or is this demonic? And, and it protects us. It insulates us from that, that stupidity. It doesn't line up with your word, Lord. You know, can I open the Bible and find what this person is telling me and it lines up with the word of God? Or is it just, you know, poppycock? And, and that's the thing is there's always going to be that. There's always going to be false prophets. Verse 24, And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall, you shall see on that day when you go into the inner chamber to hide. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Amnon, Amnon the governor of the city, and to jo- Joash, the, the king's son, and said, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I return in peace. But Micaiah said, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Take heed, all you people. So God gives him a serious warning to the people. Um, you guys, watch out. You're going to follow this guy into battle. It's not going to end well. You're going to be sheep without a shepherd. Verse 28, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. At this point, it's been really difficult for Jehoshaphat, I'm sure. I just to think, okay, wait a minute. All these prophets that I didn't feel comfortable with, and the one guy I felt comfortable with said, you shouldn't feel comfortable. <laughs> and so he's going anyway, but he already gave his word, right? He already told him he'd do it. Um, sometimes you just have to stand up for what's right, and, and Jehoshaphat has a hard time doing that. You know, he, he's all about reforms when he's standing up in front of, every, of everybody, but when he's face-to-face with a person, you know, and that's the difficulty, isn't it? It's a little bit hard to, to stand up for what's right when you're looking at somebody in the eye. But somebody has to. I've been in a room with a whole group of pastors. I remember as a very young pastor, I was a brand new pastor, and I was sitting there amongst a bunch of other pastors, 
Godly men, guys I, I love and trust. And listen to somebody say something that was so off the wall that any of you would recognize that is completely off base. And here I am, the young guy, the new guy. And so the first time, I didn't say anything. I was just like, what? And everybody was just like, yeah, let's pray for him. you know. And he's like, I'm doing this crazy thing that no Christian should ever do. Everybody's praying for him to do it. I was like, what in the world is going on here? Did not build my confidence in the church. <laughs> After that, I went and talked to the guy alone and said, hey, you can't do that. He's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. I do that all the time. I'm like, okay, well, that's stupid. The second time it was brought up or another situation brought up, I was done staying silent. And so I'm the big mouth. And I say, uh, wrong. Had a guy from Boise telling us, you know, hey, sometimes we just need to hold hands with people we don't agree with so that we can cause, you know, get the greater good done. And I said, well, the greater good and the only good that I want to do and the only reason I do public service works is to share the gospel. And if I'm going to put down the gospel so that I can paint somebody's house to look good and stand next to a, a, an LDS person, a Jehovah's Witness and whoever else, I'm not going to be a part of that. Because if I can't share the gospel, then I have no point in any, doing any of this stuff. And then everybody agreed with me. But nobody was saying anything. I, I gave everybody else an opportunity. Nobody said anything, so I had to open my big mouth. When the guy was coming in talking about he's going to allow polygamists in his church, I waited for somebody else to say something. I was the only one who would say anything. You know, actually, that was, the, that was the meeting that Jason was in that he decided, you know, I'm going to be with Mike. I'm not on Mike's side after that. But you have to stand up and say something when something's wrong. And Jehoshaphat just wouldn't do it. And so, they went up against Ramoth Gilead. Verse 29, The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. Okay, you dress up like the king. I'm going to dress up like a foot soldier and hide in the back. And uh, that way, you can get attacked, and I don't get attacked. I mean, that would, Jehoshaphat has to be the most gullible person in the world. And, you know, this is just Jehoshaphat. I mean, jump in Jehoshaphat. The guy does not know when to not jump into something stupid. And he's going to do it again and again and again in his life. Um, anyway, so, okay. Verse 30. <laughs> now the king of Israel had commanded the captains of the chariots who were with him, saying, fight with no one, small or great, but only the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, it is the king of Israel. Therefore, they surrounded him to attack. But Jehoshaphat cried out to the Lord, and, and the Lord helped him, and God diverted them from him. For so it was that when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. How did they know he wasn't the king of Israel? Taller, shorter, chubbier, skinnier? Probably no, because he cried out to the Lord, and they're like, oh, that's not Ahab. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? out of here. This guy's obviously not the guy. In verse 33, and this is, this is so interesting. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of the battle for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot. Then he would do this so that his guys wouldn't get demoralized. They'd continue to fight. So he props himself up in his chariot, facing the Syrians until evening, and about that time of the sunset he died. And so, and so he tries to maneuver it. You know, when the word of the Lord comes down, it's the word of the Lord, right? He's not going to hide. He's not going to trick him. And so he dies and, and just so we know what happens, we'll just read these next three verses in 19. It says, Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. But notice this, verse 2. Then Je Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you. And... Um, in, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek the Lord. And so he gets rebuked, but there's no punishment. You know, the Lord's angry with you. The wrath of the Lord is, you know, he's glaring at you, but he loves you. 
You know, you've done what's right. You know, and this should be a lesson to us. You know, sometimes, we, you know, maybe it's another church. You don't know the heart of another person. And you're, you know, hanging out with people that you, you know, don't know aren't really Christians. Other times, you know darn well that that person has nothing to do with the Lord. That person is wicked in their heart. That person is no business being in your life except that you're sharing the gospel with them 24-7. And, and, and yet, you know, sometimes we just make bad decisions. Remember, the five people you're closest to are who you are going to be like. And so th- you think about that. Who do I, who do I surround myself with? And, and, and hopefully that doesn't make all you think, oh, I'm going to find wealthy, rich people and see, see if they'll hang out with me. <laughs> but really our heart should be, I want to find people who love the Lord more than I love the Lord. So that that attitude and that heart can rub off on me. And I can start pursuing the Lord. Surround yourself with people that you admire in the Lord. And allow those people to influence you and to, to, to mature you in Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for just this, the life of Jehoshaphat. And we learned so many lessons from him. Lord, every king of Israel and every character in the word that we read about, their lives and the way that they served you and followed you and the way that they forsook you at times and the way that they made mistakes. And Lord, yet your love and your grace is always there, seeking, yearning for them to repent, to turn to you, delighting in those who follow you and walk with you and serve you. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to learn these lessons so that we can save ourselves pain in our lives, that we would follow you, that we would love you, that we would walk with you, that our hearts would be towards you and that we would be a blessing to your kingdom, and that you would be a blessing in our lives, Lord, that you would not be there for for chastisement, Lord, but for blessing. Help us to turn our hearts completely towards you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Can you stand with me?